This is Matthew Snape here. I'm a paediatrician that works at the Oxford Vaccine Group and I've been asked to speak to you about designing Phase 1 and Phase 2 pre-licensure trials for vaccines. This is the group I work with. It's the Oxford Vaccine Group and it's part of the University of Oxford. So I'm standing on the back row at the far right as you look at this screen. The Oxford Vaccine Group have enrolled over 12,000 participants to research studies over the last decade, many of which are into clinical trials. And these involve both children and adults and run all the way from phase one studies through to phase four studies. And that's why I have some insights into designing effective phase one and phase two studies. Now clearly, before a vaccine candidate gets to clinical trials, it's gone through extensive testing in vitro in the laboratory and then animal testing, preclinical animal testing in vivo and then it gets to the clinical study itself. And the ultimate goal of these clinical trials is licensing. And so these phase one, two, and three studies are designed to generate the data that are required by the national regulatory authorities, whether that's in Europe it's under the, under the uh, guidance of the European Medicines Agency, or for example, in uh, the United States, the FDA, it's the phase one to three clinical trials that are generating the data that's required for these. So broadly, we're talking about running through phase one studies where you're talking with 20 to 100 participants, and phase two, which will be enrolling more than that, and the other ones we'll be focusing on at the moment. Now, obviously, a very small percentage of vaccine candidate makes it through all stage. It usually takes about a 10 year process to get all the way through the clinical trial development pre-licensure. So if we focus on phase one studies initially, and these generally involve healthy volunteers, of which are either adult males or non-pregnant females, and they und undergo extensive physical and mental health screening prior to enrolment. And sometimes these can start in healthy adults and then de-escalate into younger age groups and they variably call it phase 1b or 2a, and it's a fairly arbitrary distinction. So when you're looking at the objectives of a phase 1 study, in the first case it's about safety, and there's very active surveillance for any adverse events that occur during the study, whether or not they're related to the immunisation. These will be the nature of solicited adverse events, as you may well be familiar with from vaccine trials, looking at systemic react, uh, symptoms such as fever, or malaise, uh, or myalgia, and also and for local reactions at the injection site. And they'll also be looking for unsolicited adverse events, actively asking participants if there's anything else unusual that they've noticed about their health in the, in the period following immunization, and with a special focus on anything that might be a serious adverse event, such as hospitalization or anything else that meets those criteria. So the active surveillance to look for those. Given it's a vaccine study, there will often be uh, immunogenicity objectives as well. But it needs to be remembered that these studies, phase one studies, are usually in healthy adults, which are not always the target population for the vaccines. Therefore, the immune, the immune response of healthy adults needs to be uh, evaluated, keeping in mind that it may well differ in either pediatric age groups or in the elderly. The sample size for these studies are usually more designed for descriptive purposes, so often 10 to 15 to 20 in each arm of the study, and that's more for descriptive purposes rather than any form of statistical analysis. So looking at the design of phase one studies and some common features there, they'll often involve dose escalation, so that the vaccine will initially be given at a low dose and then progressing up through higher doses. And they may well look at alternative formulations such as with or without an adjuvant, or immunisation schedules, such as uh, giving one, two or three doses, or differing intervals between those doses. The, if a, they may well be open-labelled, and often uncontrolled, and the benefits of using a control or vaccine or placebo vaccine in a phase one study are debated. If a placebo or control vaccine is used, then whether that is then is either fully blinded or partially blinded is also another uh, an area of debate. 
it can often be difficult to have a fully blinded study in terms of getting the formulations for the vaccines and placebos to look identical. And in that case, there may well be both blinded and unblinded clinical trial teams, with the latter being able to give the vaccines, but not make any of the assessments relating to immunisation. Another important feature when it comes to uh, phase one studies is the role of the Data Safety Monitoring Committee. There will often be paused, there will be planned pauses in recruitment for <coughs> data safety monitoring reviews and to decide whether or not the study is to proceed. Um, these may either follow recruitment of a small initial subset of participants or prior to a dose escalation, or there may be predefined adverse event criteria. For example, if more than two out of eight participants experience a grade three systemic event that will trigger a data safety monitoring review, you will then decide whether or not to proceed with the study. So to take a specific example, one we've done recently at the Oxford Vaccine Group was of a vaccine against serogroup B meningococcus. And this was a genetically modified outer membrane vesicle vaccine, which had target protein overexpression. And in this vaccine study, we were recruiting 18 to 45 year olds, 52 in total, 26 of whom got a dose of 25 micrograms, and then the remaining 26 got a dose of 50 micrograms. This was open label. And ultimately, the target population here was for global use in children and adolescents, but of course, as always, you start with healthy volunteers. 18 to 45 years of age or thereabouts. And just quickly to look at this study in more detail, um, the, 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 the study information booklet is displayed there. Um, this is a vaccine that was developed in Oxford and was a first in that phase one study and against Neisseria meningitis, a major cause of meningitis and septicemia. In this first in man phase one study, as we said, we had 52 participants who received a total of 156 immunizations, so three vaccines each. And that gave, with a seven day immunization, uh, a seven day post immunization surveillance period, 192 safety days of data. Throughout this study, there were 624 blood samples collected uh, overall. And the safety monitoring was performed by an electronic diary, which um, solicited all adverse events for one week. And then, of course, any medically significant or serious adverse events were conducted, collected throughout the study. And the blood samples that you can see there were, in the first instance, focused on safety, so looking at biochemistry and hematology parameters, and also looking at generating immunogenicity data, looking at serum bactericidal antibodies and antibody titers and both B and T cell responses, etc. A study like this took, takes an enormous amount of planning. And you can see here the kind of uh, spreadsheet that was developed within our group to try and look at how many participants should be immunized on any particular day and at any particular dose and the dark brown bits you can see in the central column related to data safety monitoring uh, reviews. So the blue boxes are vaccine dosage given over four weeks and then a, a data safety monitoring pause and then the recruitment resumes at a higher dose and then the subsequent blue uh, boxes indicate second and then third doses and so a great deal of planning goes into being able to conduct these studies efficiently um, while still generating accurate data that's going to meet data, data safety monitoring committee requirements. Another example of a recent phase one study that we've conducted is about is for a vaccine against Ebola virus disease. Uh, this was obviously conducted at in an expedited manner in response to the recent outbreak and again targeted 18 to 45 year olds with 72 participants. This was an observer blinded study so it did have a placebo arm as you can see here. For example if we look at group one in the top row here this enrolled 18 participants 15 of whom got a MVA viral vectored vaccine uh, at day one and then 29 days later got an adeno adenovirus 26 vectored vaccine. And if you're uh, randomized to this group, uh, 15 of the participants received the active immunizations and three received placebo. This was partially blinded so the people giving the vaccines knew which ones they were giving, but neither the participant nor the, un the, nor the blinded uh, clinical trial members knew which vaccine was being given. 
And if you enrolled, for example, into group three, then the order of the vaccines was reversed. And uh, then the vaccines in the different orders were either given at one month or two month intervals, or in group five at a two week interval. So looking, as I said, at different orders, different um, schedules for the vaccines to be given. And in this case, we did have a comparison with the placebo. The focus, as always, was looking at safety, but some immunogenicity data was then collected and then becomes, once the safety criteria met, the, obviously the focus does fall onto the immunogenicity criteria. And then another example, just to, to finish off with, is an RSV vaccine study, which was conducted and published in um, Science and Translational Medicine last year, looking at, again, adenoviral and MVA vectors expressing target proteins from the respiratory syncytial virus, a common cause of respiratory infections in children. Even though this is targeted at children, again, it enrolled 18 to 50 year olds in this case. 42 participants, completely open labeled, and they were randomized to four groups with a different prime boost order. So, who takes part in these studies, and what do they need to know before they do so? For the meningococcal vaccine, uh, which was a vaccine study, which is the first example I gave you, the Information booklet was 15 pages of A4 uh, paper going into the study in great depth. And of course, the participants need to know if this is a first in human study, and that is explicitly stated, as you can see here. This is text taken from that information booklet. You're able to give some uh, comparisons with uh, previously used vaccines that might share some similarities with this vaccine that we're using here, in this case, uh, data from other outer membrane vesicle meningococcal vaccines or information from the preclinical animal studies and any concerns about safety that may or may not have been raised during those vaccines. Participants clearly, um, some of them will be taking part uh, for the compensation that can happen. In this case, it was up to £450. So no one's going to get rich from doing these studies. And in our experience, many of the participants are actually taking part for altruistic reasons, especially when it comes to studies like the Ebola vaccine study. And of course, given that some volunteers will be taking part for, uh, partly for the financial compensation, it's important to avoid over-volunteering and to make sure that any, each participant is only taking part in one study at a time. And for this reason, uh, various uh, databases have been generated to record volunteers for for these studies and the one that's used in the UK is the TOPS database uh, which is the acronym for the over volunteering prevention system and for all our participants that take part in our uh, uh, adult studies we uh, insist that they register on the TOPS database and that we can therefore check to see if they're actually taking part in any other vaccine studies at the same time. There are similar systems or Similarly, uh, systems with similar objectives that are run in Germany and in France. And uh, we have found this very useful and, and certainly have identified participants that have misrepresented their participation in other clinical trials. It's also worth mentioning specifically the data safety monitoring committees in the phase one trials, the DSMCs. And it's, these will generally be independent of the study investigators and will report then to a study management committee that will make decisions about whether the study is to stop or proceed. And they will primarily be focusing on the adverse event data. And the exact criteria by which they'll be measuring the data, the adverse event data, and how often they need to meet, and what the powers that they will have to stop a study or not, will all be pre-specified in a data safety monitoring charter. And some particular vaccines will require special consideration. For example, if the vaccine in question is a live viral or even bacterial vaccine, then specific consideration needs to be given to whether that vaccine is then shed by the volunteers and uh, there may be particular shedding studies to detect the, uh, the virus, for example, in respiratory secretions or, or, or otherwise. Um, likewise, for genetically modified organisms in phase one studies, there will be specific criteria looking, especially if that is a live 
replicating genetically modified organisms, looking for shedding studies or having specific containment requirements relating to that. So we'll now move on to consider phase two studies. Um, so at the point that you're planning to commence your phase two studies, you will have your data from your phase one, which hopefully will have given you uh, some reassurance about safety. It may have given you one or two safety signals that need following up in the phase two study as you enroll more participants. And hopefully it will give you some idea about uh, the immunogenicity of the vaccine that you're looking at and the preferred dose or formulation, or even give you a number of different formulations or doses that need further evaluation in that phase two study. And as a paediatrician, I know that the distinction between phase one and phase two studies is not always clear, especially for first in child studies, these can be variously referred to as phase one, or phase one B or phase two A. And as you're getting into phase two studies, generally these are studies that have gone through phase one. And uh, these may be vaccines that have got entirely novel antigens, or they may be new formulations of existing vaccines or antigens, um, such as uh, if there's an adaptation with, a different, with an existing vaccine in a different manufacturing process that may well still need to go through uh, into a phase two studies or existing vaccines used in new combinations. And of course, there's uh, any number of combinations of diphtheria, tetanus, pertussis vaccines, each of which, when it's reformulated, will need to go through at least phase two study. And at this phase two study, you may still be assessing alternative formulations or doses of the vaccine candidates that you want to be looking at. Thinking about what the objectives of these, these phase two studies will be, Clearly, again, it's important to generate as much safety information as possible. And so further safety information will be monitored. Maybe um, the clinical advent, adverse event monitoring is often similar to phase one. So uh, solicited adverse events collected by diary cards uns and unsolicited events similarly collected by diary cards may be less in the way of active surveillance regarding this and also for serious adverse events. Usually there's less in the way of intensive laboratory monitoring. So for example, not necessarily needing to do biochemistry and hematology uh, monitoring uh, uh, from a safety aspect as was done in the phase one studies. But now you're especially interested in the determination of immunogenicity and you may well be getting into the target populations of interest for this vaccine, whether that be geographic. So for example, if this is a vaccine used for sub-Saharan Africa, then it's in the phase two studies that will often go into those populations. The phase one's often having been done in European or North American countries. Or you may be moving out of the healthy adult age range into the either the pediatric or elderly age range that you're interested in. And it may be at this point that you start to consider how the vaccine is going to be used in existing immunization schedules. So for example, for many of the pediatric vaccines, they'll need to be given concomitantly with other vaccines. And so it's often at this point that you start to give them alongside the routine immunizations to see how well that would work and if they, any impact is had on the immunogen immunogenicity of existing vaccines or whether the existing vaccines impact on the immunogenicity of your new candidate vaccine. Uh, the endpoints that will be used to help determine those objectives will often be the percentage achieving a threshold for a level of correlative protection, um, if, if that is available, or it can be thinking about non-inferiority for immunogenicity endpoints, antibody titles, for example, with existing vaccines. So bridging studies to show we, if vaccine A is already licensed, we have a new formulation of this vaccine, call it vaccine B, is the immune response to vaccine B within a acceptable, um, acceptable limits compared to vaccine A. It's a bridging study. And there may be specific vaccine studies looking at protection against challenge, and I'll come up to that in just a little bit. Again, if you're looking at a live vaccine, then you may well be, uh, for example, a live attenuated vaccine, you may well be looking at shedding studies to see if it's shed, and importantly, to see if it's transmitted to healthy or uh, transmitted to other individuals around you. This is for example, you could imagine it be especially relevant for formulations of uh, live attenuated respiratory 
vaccine, such as influenza, does the participant, does the vaccine recipient shed the live attenuated virus after immunization? And then can that be transmitted to close contacts who may potentially, once the vaccine is licensed for widespread use, be immunocompromised? So it's important information to be gathering from that point of view. There's also important information to look to think about the genetic stability of those isolates. If you're looking at a live attenuated influenza or RSV vaccine, you would want to know that that virus remains stable and does not revert to wild type. So that can be important information gained from the phase two studies. Phase two studies are, will usually have a control arm, which will either be an active comparator or placebo. Um, and these are useful to allow interpretation of, of the immunogenicity, especially, for example, if natural exposure to the antigen in question occurs commonly, uh, occurs commonly, such as it can do for influenza or varicella. It's very useful to have a control arm to compare the uh, immune response or the immune profile seen in children who receive the active vaccine versus placebo. And again, it can be helpful to get some data on safety using a control arm. We all know that, for example, children in particular are quite commonly experiencing concomitant fevers or other non-related infections, or may, might even become significantly unwell and end up in hospital for unrelated infections. And it can be quite reassuring to have a control arm to see if the, these, the incidence of these types of adverse events are any different to in children who receive the active versus um, placebo vaccine or control vaccine. And I've just implied there an important issue, which is that we do tend to prefer active controls, especially for use in children who are unable to consent for themselves as to whether or not to take part in the study. Um, saline injections for, as use of placebo are conducted where there is, are used when there is no alternative in children, and there are precedents in the literature for this, but in general, uh, the, the preference is to actually use something that is going to potentially be of benefit to that child. So, for example, if they're over one year of age and getting a vaccine against meningococcal disease, the control arm might consist of the vaccines against um, varicella or, or hepatitis B, some other control vaccine that wasn't in the routine schedule at that time. Again, the same issue about blinding comes into play and that it can be very difficult to fully blind a vaccine study to generate so that the dummy or control vaccine looks exactly the same as the investigational vaccine. So again, many of these trials are conducted using are either open labeled or using blinded and unblinded clinical trials so that the people making the evaluations either of adverse events, uh, evaluating for diaries and so on, and the, that includes the parents, or those making the assessment of the immunogenicity uh, in, in responses in the laboratory are blinded as to uh, whether the samples have been taken from a vaccine or control risk. So again, if we look at some specific examples, and this is one that we weren't specifically involved with, but this is a, um, we were involved in general in the development of meningococcal B vaccines. And this is an infant study in which, which was described as a phase one slash two study in which infants were given different doses of a candidate meningococcal, meningococcal, meningococcal vaccine. At this point, um, participants were receiving either the active vaccine or control, as you can see, and they got a uh, lowish dose at 20 micrograms, and then uh, the next step of the study involved stepping up to 60 micrograms. And at this point, uh, concern arose Specifically, after 10 subjects received the 60 microgram dose, one developed aseptic meningitis, triggering a protocol to find pause in a cumulative safety evaluation. This safety evaluation then identified that, um, and it just that, that there was an issue with fever. And, and if we look at this graph, we can see that in the dark grey in the left-hand columns, that's the control vaccine, a control receiving placebo, 
and then in the uh, middle columns of the lighter grey, these are the dose of 20 micrograms, and then the and then the third column is those receiving a dose of 60 micrograms. And you can see that uh, any fever was experienced in 63% of those getting the lower dose of vaccine, and then 80% of those receiving the higher dose of vaccine. And most of those fevers were mild, but some were moderate. And so the Data Safety Monitoring Committee. So at this point, the Data Safety Monitoring Committee did review this, and it's a uh, with small numbers of participants, this is certainly can be quite a difficult evaluation to make. The Data Safety Monitoring Review then did decide that although the aseptic meningitis that actually triggered the Data Safety Monitoring Review was actually considered not related to the vaccine by the treating physician, by the time they'd reviewed all the safety data and revealed that 80% of the vaccine recipients at the higher dose were having mild or moderate fever, then this was thought to be of concern. And at that point, it was actually the sponsor who decided to terminate that study after the trial was deemed not acceptable in that population. And you can see, therefore, that the study was terminated. The planned extension to go to higher doses still was not, uh, not taken forward. But in fact, this vaccine has um, was taken forward in adolescents and was licensed for use in adolescents in North America and, uh, and is being in use at the moment, um, where the safety profile and reaction density profile was, did not raise these same concerns. And as a matter of contrast now, there was another meningococcal B vaccine that was in development around the same time. And this is one that we were involved with at the Oxford Vaccine Group, where participants, as you can see in this study, were randomized in this phase two study to receive um, the vaccines uh, in two different formulations of the vaccines with or without an outer membrane vesicle and to get that at either 2, 4, 6 and 12 months of age or a single dose at 12 months of age and the blood tests taken at the same time. And importantly this vaccine, this was the first in child study and the vaccines were being given concomitantly alongside routine vaccines that you can see outlined at the bottom of this um, slide. And there were two different fac formulations of the vaccine being evaluated at this point. And as you can see, these were then assessed against a range of different meningococcal strains to look at basically looking at the breadth of protection afforded by this vaccine. And at the top is one formulation of the vaccine, just with recombinant proteins alone. And at the top, at the bottom, is another formulation of the vaccine using those recombinant proteins in combination with an outer membrane vesicle. And you can see uh, just from the percentage of children actually mounting a response against when tested against these different strains, so generating antibodies that would be able to kill these different strains in the laboratory, you can see that the, the vaccine with the outer membrane vesicle generated a broader protection. And this was the formulation that was then taken forward. And so the, uh, the formulation without the outer membrane vesicle was then uh, abandoned. And in this study, clearly there was some attention paid to the rates of fever being observed, especially given the experience with the other men B vaccine in development. In this study, quite low rates of fever were seen in comparison to the previous study. Uh, you can see in the far right-hand columns of both of these graphs that fever rates were under 20 to under 20 percent. Interestingly, as the vaccine then went into the further phase two and phase three studies, actually higher rates of fever were detected in infants, up to around 60 percent. I guess this can show the limitation of making evaluations on a relatively small number of participants, uh, in, as, as was the case in this phase two study. This vaccine has, of course, gone on to be licensed and is recently being used, uh, been recently introduced into the routine immunisation schedule of the UK. Now, I mentioned earlier that one particular type of phase two study is a challenge study, where you're not just looking at the safety of the vaccine, you're not just looking at the immune response against the vaccine, you're actually trying to show direct evidence of whether or not the vaccine works. And so for uh, some specific diseases, this can be possible. A human challenge where you deliberately infect participants with the disease in question um, can be possible. And this can be very useful to either identify 
correlates of protection against the organism in question or provide early data and efficacy for the vaccine. Clearly these are only conducted in healthy adult populations but can provide a useful gateway for the further development of the vaccines, for example in paediatric populations in phase 2 or phase 3 studies. So what are we talking about? Well, for example, uh, from there's a recent review article in Lancet Infectious Diseases looking at different um, diseases for which where it has been possible to generate uh, to develop challenge studies. So, for example, uh, this include challenge studies where where vol healthy volunteers are challenged with either rhinovirus or respiratory syncytial virus or influenza, and um, this can tie into vaccine development in that if you set up a study where uh, half of the people that are going to be challenged receive the vaccine and half receive a placebo or a control vaccine, then you can look to see if the vaccine actually prevents infection in those that have the, uh, are exposed, deliberately exposed to the organism in question. And this has been done for a wide range of organisms, including um, typhoid and malaria. And, and the other organisms that you can see here. And this is one in particular that we've been doing at the Oxford Vaccine Group, looking at using a Salmonella typhoid, uh, Salmonella typhi challenge, uh, which is being delivered in a sodium bicarbonate solution. So for example, in this study, we can see that um, in this typhoid challenge model, we were able to generate, a, to identify the dose of toy, typhoid to be taken orally by volunteers that would reliably generate an attack rate of around 65%. So about two thirds of participants um, undertaking this challenge study would become unwell with typhoid and then, of course, then were treated and effectively and, uh, and, and made full recoveries. And of course, this all went through the appropriate uh, ethical approvals and with fully informed consent. And this is only possible for diseases that are either uh, relatively benign in nature in healthy adults or for where there are clearly effective treatments such as typhoid or malaria that can be instituted uh, at, uh, at the first sign of symptoms or after a pre-specified number of days. And just to look at some of the data that we have generated from these uh, studies, this is one participant who had been exposed to typhoid uh, deliberately and did not develop any symptoms, so it was in the one third that didn't develop any symptoms. And this is a, a participant that then did proceed to develop typhoid um, at around day eight to nine after exposure. And this typhoid challenge model has therefore been taken forward into further uh, study design where the volunteers have either received a placebo or a candidate typhoid vaccine or an existing oral typhoid vaccine to compare the effectiveness and that data will likely be published shortly. So in summary, at the point of decision for dis commencing phase three studies enrolling thousands of participants, phase one and phase two studies should have identified information on common side effects that can be expected, and potential safety signals, potentially unexpected safety, effect, uh, safety signals that might require further evaluation in a phase three study, looking specifically for the incidence of that uh, particular adverse event in larger numbers of participants. They would certainly have provided some information on immunogenicity and possibly in a challenge model effectiveness in the relevant population and you'll hopefully know what is the optimal formulation and the dose and the schedule to be used in the phase three study. You will also, especially for pediatric studies, hopefully have de developed data that tell you about their use alongside the routine immunization schedule. And all of this should inform appropriate study design and sample size for phase three studies. And so this is my disclosure at the end and I hope you found this presentation informative.